Welcome, everybody. Nice to see our guests and really appreciate you joining us. Welcome to the February LBVBS Zoom presentation featuring Mr. Lloyd Godman. Paul Nukamura has now mooted all participants for this presentation. Adjust the view on your screen in your Zoom window for either speaker or gallery. Our speaker will take questions after his presentation. He will tell you when he is finished for your questions and you may unmute yourself for your question only and then when you're done, remute yourself, please. Uh, the LBVBS Club Affairs will be discussed after this presentation. If you would like to receive announcements for future meetings, uh, feel free to email to that address, that's our uh, club address and Gene will add you to our list. We thank you Lloyd for the time and effort you put into your presentation for us tonight. Lloyd is an ecological artist based in Melbourne, Australia who uses air plants to create living sculptures. In 1999, he earned an MFA from Armit in 1999, sorry. He established and was head of the photographic section of the Dundon Art School for 20 years and then taught at RMIT Melbourne for nine years. In 1996, he began working with bromeliad as a medium by growing images into the leaves via photosynthesis. The work evolved into complex interactive gallery installations of bromeliads. Since 2010, has become interested in how plants and in particular Tillandsias can be integrated into urban architecture in a fully sustainable manner and continues a project titled Tillandsia Swarm where the plants are tested in extreme conditions. <clears throat> His sculptural work with Tillandsias is summed up in this quote by John Power. Godman's installations are the result <coughs> of a unique blend of botanical science environmental awareness and artistic expression. <coughs> Excuse me. All three elements are intrinsic to the practical realization of this polymathic vision. He has also compiled an intense, extensive document on Tillandsia's titled Tillandsia Mania, which is updated every year. Oops. Lloyd lives in the Baldison Press with his partner Tess on 13 acres of brush and has extensive collection of bromeliads and a large greenhouse where he propagates and grows Tillandsias from seed. <clears throat> the LBVBS is a nonprofit organization. Our presenters, members, and video producers are not financially compensated for these presentations. Attendance at our Zoom presentations is free to all bromeliad enthusiasts. Donations can be made to the LBVBS to offset our Zoom presentation costs using PayPal. The following two slides will show the PayPal website link and then the scan code. Either one can be used if you'd like to support our efforts. If you have a phone and you wanna take a picture of it, that works. And they're also posted in uh, chat. Yeah. So thank you for this. And we look forward to your presentation, Lloyd. Okay, thank you, Ken and Paul and, and Barry and everybody else. Um, it's uh, certainly a delight to be able to do this and uh, share what, what I've been doing with everyone. Um, so thank you there. Uh, I've got one mosquito flying around here, which may be gone to God, hopefully. <clears throat> so what I'll do is um, uh, this, all, this actually all runs out of a PDF, so it's all together. So if you want to get a hold of me, uh, you can see the screen, everyone? Not yet. Oh, not yet. I have to share. Uh, where are we? Share screen. Share. 
That's it? Yep. yep. Okay, so if anyone wants to get a hold of me, uh, my email is lloydgodman at gmail.com. <clears throat> my uh, web address is lloydgodman.net. When you go to that page, you will see a thing that says click, uh, or it says get the ebook. Click there, and you can see all of my projects as PDFs. You can download all of them as free, uh, low res non-interactive PDFs, except the uh, Talanzia book. Uh, so all of the stuff I'm showing you, you can basically go back and have a look at by going to this web address and then go to get the ebook. Um, so Barry just wanted to suggest that I kind of point out where I actually live. Where I used to live was here in Dunedin, and I actually grew bromeliads and Talanzias way down here and I lived a few hundred meters from the coast and um, the plants actually uh, thrived in, in sort of salt winds. Um, I've since moved to Melbourne which is here and uh, so this is Melbourne and we live away about 40 kilometers out in the bush and this is where we live here. Uh, my partner's um, uh, late husband was a famous Australian artist and he built a studio. George died about uh, 43 years ago. So we have artists come from all over the world and work in the studio. Um, there are bromeliads growing all in these yellow areas here. <clears throat> the house is here. We have a vegetable garden there a cottage where Tessa's son with his uh, wife and two kids and nearly three live with us on the property and the greenhouse is here and there's a big orchard with about 160 varieties of fruit. <clears throat> so all of that keeps me pretty busy. These are a few shots of uh, the garden and various bromeliads. A, lo a lot of the... Um, uh, a lot of the bromeliads are growing as epiphytes on trees. Uh, we often have problems with deer, possums, wallabies, and things like that, inquiring about whether they can eat them, uh, which can become a bit of an issue. But you, it gives you a sense of the garden where uh, I actually am. So um, what we'll do now is I'll see if this... I should be able to go here and go optimize video clip <clears throat> and we'll see if this will play. Uh, this will just give you uh, an introduction to um, then I can my pull little across. greenhouse. So I'll and pull that back to the start. Here we are. We got sound. Yes. Okay. In good. here is an area that I use to photograph the plants. I've got studio lights and a black background that I can pull across and set up some proper lighting to photograph the plants. In here is the office where I can work and also, there's a couch I can sit down and prick out little uh, Talanzia seedlings and glue them onto fly screen cylinders that you'll see later. Outside is a series of shade houses. And on the ground here, we've got a motorized sprayer that I can mix fertilizer, put it in, and fertilize the plants. Let's see if I can get that. This is the first yeah. section of the greenhouse. The two sections can be isolated. And I've got a series of germination boxes here that are humidity controlled and they have a temperature control. So they'll germinate quite nicely in winter. And this is uh, also one of the germination boxes, which I quite like, which is 
an old humidity crib that babies would have been um, in. It was part of the Air Ambulance Service of Victoria. And babies would have been flying around the country in this uh, from where they were born to hospital. And at the moment, there's loads of little Tillandsia seedlings in there germinating away. Once the plants come out of the germination boxes, they go into these open boxes where they have to fend them for themselves a bit more. And there's loads and loads and loads of those boxes, layers of them. One layer creates shade for the layer be below, so they start on the bottom and move to the top. There's also a lot of larger Tillandsias in here, and when they flower, I pollinate them. Uh, and in one day with these plants and the Tillandsias outside, I pollinated over 700 flowers. This is the second section of the greenhouse, which uh, was built during the lockdown. And again, miles and miles more Tillandsias. On the ground are other broms that increase the humidity. So when they come off the little seed trays, they go onto these fly net cylinders and they just love these cylinders because there's loads of air movement through them. This is um, a fan which uh, draws air from underneath the ground and blows it around the greenhouse and in winter it cools and in summer, sorry in winter it heats and in summer it cools the the air in here. I've got a, a couple of tomatoes and peppers in here which I can grow through the winter in bathtubs. More broms on the ground. More tillandsias. A couple of beehives outside. There's some pavers I've got to lay on the floor in here yet. And again, more Tillandsias. So that gives you a pretty good idea of what I've got in terms of the greenhouses and so on. Where's the uh, there? Okay. Um, do we go back here and go uh, there? So I'll just. Can anyone, everybody, hear me? Yeah. I can't hear my. Oh no, the sounds just come on. That's it. It was dead through the video. So uh, what I'll do first, uh, there's a lot of uh, material here. And as I said, a lot of this you can go and have a look at yourself. So this book, for instance, you, if you go to the, the um, website, you'll be able to get this free. Um, I began as uh, an artist uh, working in photography and in the short story is that um, over a long period of time, I started using plants as a form of photography and growing images into the leaves of the plants. Uh, and that kind of um, moved into, so I would put tape on the leaf and leave them in the sun for four months and I would take the tape off and I would have a rudimentary image in the leaf. I'm just flicking through this really quickly because there's a lot of material. So if you want to go back and have a look, uh, then just go to this book. This one's called Working with Plants. 
Uh, and then I did installations. Uh, this one is in a coal burning boiler house, filled it up with um, uh, uh, bromeliads. And the idea was to play off the parasite and the epiphyte. Um, then I did uh, uh, museum cases full of plants on the left hand side. The names were perfect and on the right hand side they were all sort of spelt wrong and falling to pieces and the plants were climbing up the wall. And everyone is probably uh, familiar and frustrated with the way names of plants change uh, seemingly almost by the week. So it was sort of a comment on that. I'll flick through some of these other projects though so I can get to I, oh, I filled lifts up with plants. Um, I put them on people and mannequins. This is all about 1998. Uh, and then I did this piece here. And I had seven infrared activated projectors. So when you stepped into the gallery, uh, you turned the, the uh, projectors on and they shone shadow patterns of the plants across the screens. And if you stop moving, the projectors would turn off and it would all go black. But the, the interesting thing with this is that um, a lot of artists that try and put plants into galleries run into all sorts of problems because the air is, um, is not very humid and they die. But the, um, the bromeliads were actually fine and particularly the tillandsias. So when the central projector turned on it created the word light as a shadow all the shadows of the word of the um, plants linked up and made this cryptic word light um, so this gives you an idea of how the 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 um, different lights would cr create different shadow patterns and here you get an idea of um, the text the the screens were tissue paper screens so um, that was the kind of work I was doing in galleries. I'll just flick through some of this other stuff a little bit quicker. And um, so this, this one here, the plants were suspended. There was a projector. It projected light onto sheets of photographic paper. And that uh, self-developed through the action of light during the exhibition. So the the shadow patterns of the plants uh, materialized during the exhibition. And at the end of the exhibition, I did a performance and processed all the sheets of paper and we put them back up on the wall. I had a friend of mine who's a composer who played during the, uh, the closing of the exhibition. Then I did this piece here, uh, which was called T Time Lamps at uh, Museum of Contemporary Art in Georgia. Now there were no bromeliads in this, but there were plants here and people would photograph themselves in front of the plants, which would go into a little computer, which would play time lapse sequences from the first image to the last image, uh, 50 images in a sequence. So it would appear that the plants grew faster and faster. But the only problem was that the, um, the plants didn't get watered and they died. So over a period of time, um, the plants actually died. They didn't. There was one woman you can see here uh, who got behind the screen and took a photograph of her breasts, which was kind of uh, hilarious. Um, so I did lots of these sort of plant installation things. Uh, and then I decided that really with what was happening with the planet and um, things like that, what I wanted to do was explore how we could bring plants into um, the urban environment and architecture in a, in a more um, sustainable way. So I'm just changing to a different document, which is called um, Tillandsia Swarm. And this is the project where we put the plants uh, on the buildings. So 
We've had them on top of Eureka Tower, which is uh, one of the tallest buildings in Melbourne, or when we put them there, it was the tallest, but it's been superseded now. We've only got a few Tillandsias up there, but they've been there six and a half years. They've never, ever been watered once. Uh, so unlike a lot of reticulated vertical garden systems where the water and nutrients are uh, running past the roots of the plants to keep them alive continuously, and of course there are lots of issues and problems with that, the idea of being able to integrate um, Tillandsias into architecture is, is very appealing. Uh, of course, there's a, a reduction in weight and the maintenance issues just uh, just go right right down. So that's where we've had them uh, on top. There are only a couple of little plants. We had to put them in uh, mesh cages so they wouldn't blow away on the wind. And in six years, it grew from one plant grew from that to that clump there. So they're, they're just slowly becoming uh, colonies. And this here is actually um, uh, synthetic grass that they they put on the uh, uh, on, on the landings of some of these of this building. We don't know how this has gone because we haven't been up there. But some of the plants that were tied to the drain holes uh, on the roof of the buildings uh, died, and we found out that the um, uh, the window cleaners had tipped a bucket of water over them on a hot day. So we've since moved them, and this is actually a sewer vent. So the fumes coming out of this will be pretty rich with gases, uh, and we don't know how that's going to affect the plants. So we have to go back and uh, find out about that later on. This is actually one of our state MPs uh, who became a fan of my work, and you can see the wind blowing her hair. Um, so the Tillandsia Swarm Project shows all the buildings that we've got the plants on. This is a Melbourne City Council building. Um, this is uh, kind of an interesting place. It's Esterton Airport. So the jets actually warm up and the exhaust fumes go past where these plants are and they're still alive and growing. So we've just we haven't put any plants on buildings that aren't sanctioned. We've always had permission to do it, uh, but we just keep putting them on different buildings, seeing what happens uh, and so on. So these ones are on the upstand of a passive um, solar water heater. So the idea that you can actually have plants and solar at the same time. Um, this is the main square in Melbourne called Federation Square. You can see how close to the roof they are, so they get extremely hot. And the last time we went, that's what that plant was like when we put it on. A couple of years later, it's grown through the cage and um, um, they never get watered. I mean, that, that's what we're trying to prosecute is the idea that we can select species that we can put on buildings and just leave them there. So um, these are actually some in France that we put on buildings there. So I won't go into all of these, uh, but it gives you an idea. If you want to check this out, you can go and just uh, click the green link and you'll get a free copy of this. So this one's called Tillandsia Swarm. Uh, now, where are we got to go here? Um, this one. So one of the things that I had been doing is making sculptures and using air plants in the sculptures that we can uh, we can suspend in spaces. So I just have to flick through some of this stuff a little bit quickly to get to where we want to go. Um, <coughs> here we are. So these can actually suspend and rotate on the wind. Uh, which is kind of a, a fascinating thing. And I did a project called um, Airborne for Melbourne City Council. And we had eight of these suspended rotating air plant 
sculptures up in in Melbourne for fourteen months. Um, <clears throat> so we, I don't uh, trim the plants. I photograph the sculptures as the plants sort of consume the sculpture. So I'm kind of interested in interested in how the plants will actually take over the form that I've made. This one is based on a, a double helix DNA. And that's what it sort of looks like now. So you can see the growth over a number of years has been um, quite substantial. Lloyd, um, I don't mean to interrupt. This is all being done with Arantos and Houston? Uh, my, mainly Burger Eye, Eranthus, Burger Eye Cross and Houston, yes. Thank you. We, we we could use a range of other plants, but there's no um, there's no point um, using plants that we can't get hold of if we want to do a project. Like if we if we use tectorums, they might work, but then you know we we'd never get enough to do a project. Yeah, and they're, they're so crazy. The crime thing expensive is too, too expensive. Uh, too. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so we have to work with stuff that we can actually get hold of. Um, so this was the sort of prototype for the Melbourne project. This is what they they actually look like. So we had them suspended, uh, and they would throw shadows on the ground as they were rotating and doing things like that. So. Um, this is uh, um, one you can kind of see slower exposures. So they kind of move around on the wind. They're set up so they'll rotate. I'll, I'll flick through these <coughs> relatively quickly. Uh, this is a, a much bigger one, uh, which is like a, a big sphere. It's actually based not on a globe, but on an atom. And we actually had this one up in uh, in the Grand Hyatt Hotel for a sustainability conference. They they commissioned us to put it in there. So this this one here uh, is at the Quaker School in. It's a sculpture, permanent sculpture that's at the Quaker School in Hobart in Tasmania. And I built it with the uh, with the students. And uh, the, the um, six, what they call testimonies that the, the Quakers use are based on the word spy. So we have um, simplicity, peace, uh, <clears throat> equality, community, integrity, and earth care. So these were six stainless steel poles which were held together and apart by tension cables, which is a, a thing that um, Buckminster Fuller, uh, the futurist uh, architect designed. And when we, when we actually put it in, we had it up the top of the building here, but it, the winds just proved too, too strong and we had to move it. So we've moved it to this location. That's what it was like when it was reinstalled. Three years later, that's the sort of growth we got out of it. And um, it sits there and just continues to grow and, and um, create, creates a kind of conversation piece uh, for, for the school kids. So uh, that's, that's pretty cool doing that project. And, um, I'm sorry, Lloyd, can I interrupt one second? Just so people yeah, know, sure. it, was, it was a concept of Bucky's called Tensegrity, which was from that's ten it. Tension Integrity. And it was the basis yeah. of his early research is into the, 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 the foundation of the geodesic domes. Go ahead, sorry. That's, yes, 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 you're right. Sorry, I forgot to mention that, yeah. Uh, there's a little bit more here on the swarm project, so we'll just jump this because it's already there. We did this project here called Within You, Without You that was in a gallery and it had a, a spiral that went into the gallery uh, from outside and then from the inside to the sort of the outside of the gallery. Uh, now I'll just flick through some of the stuff here. What one of the things they've been doing is looking uh, quite critically at 
um, vertical gardens and the differences of those to what we can do with tillandsias. And I've been quite critical in the way we've looked at that. Um, I, myself and a, a couple of friends that I work with wrote a paper for the Tool Building Council and uh, for the Green Building Council on the differences of using tillandsias to other plant systems. Um, I believe that um, as people who are interested in and growing, to lands is that the the scope for using these plants on buildings is absolutely huge because when we when we actually look at our uh, cities in effect they're like uh, mountainous canyons we've got you know buildings that stretch up hundreds of meters into the air you've got extreme winds you've got heat uh, you've got all of those sorts of problems now they try to overcome that when they want to grow green plants, green leafed plants by um, reticulating water through the roots. One of the problems that they run into, or um, there are quite a number of problems actually, but one of the problems they run into is that if the, if the reticulants get off the wall and they get into the concrete or they get on steel, the phosphates will just destroy the, the, uh, the steel they'll actually dissolve it. Whereas of course, tillandsias will just take all their uh, nitrates and phosphates uh, and potassium, they take that out of the atmosphere. So it's one of the reasons why they're growing very slowly, but it also means that we can put them on buildings and we don't have this problem with, uh, with the uh, fertilizers. The fertilizers they use on these buildings um, uh, they can't use organic fertilizers, they have to use inorganic fertilizers. So in the production of those fertilizers, there's significant amounts of nitrous oxide produced, which is about 700 times uh, more potent as a greenhouse gas than CO2. And in the phosphates, uh, they produce methane, which is about 25 times more potent. So there's a lot, uh, quite a few issues there. Also, um, when you reticulate liquids up and down uh, a building, the way they're doing, they catch it and then pump it to the top and drop it down again. It's a closed loop circuit. So it's similar to an evaporative water cooling system. So it has the potential to uh, build up increased levels of Legionella, Legionnaire's disease and other pathogens. Uh, so what they'll do is they'll often dump those down the drain and of course they get into waterways and, 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 and so on like that. Um, they can also build up harmful pathogens that will kill a whole species of plants. So you can have a, a wall and it can look fantastic and a week later you've got a whole section of plants which has just uh, died. They're, they're now using... Um, microfiber plastics to create what they call artificial felt uh, to trickle the nutrients down. And of course, what happens with the, the microfibers is they have the potential to break off, get in the water, and then when they purge the system, that gets into the waterways. So when we use tillandsias, uh, we, we just, you know, those problems aren't there. They're just not there. We, we, we don't have a weight problem. A lot of these, some of these gardens are running at about 100 kilos a square meter. Uh, with tillandsias, we can do that for around about five kilos a square meter. And we don't need pumps, we don't need water, we don't need nutrients, we don't have any of those sorts of problems. Of course, the other thing with uh, microfiber plastic uh, medium to trickle the liquids down is it's actually uh, a fire risk. And a lot of the buildings have an air gap between the the wall itself and and the medium uh, and the and the building, which creates a chimney. So if it was a fire, uh, it can can actually cause considerable problems. Um, so what we're looking at is how we can make screens. This is one of the ones I've got at home. 
that we can put on buildings and just leave them there basically. So this is uh, this was on a neighbor's house and it, it can move across and inside you can still see through <clears throat> and it faces west. Uh, these ones are on the roof at home. Uh, you can see Houston there. Um, the interesting thing with this is the, the a metal roof will actually heat up considerably and then cool down again. So when I go out in the morning, even in summer, the roof is quite cool and it's all covered in dew. There's a mist that settles on the roof uh, and that is enough to feed the plants. That's, that's actually all they need. Um, so they haven't been watered uh, this year at all on the roof. To give you an idea of what we're talking about with the temperatures, I'll show you uh, a slide in a minute. But they are, the screens can move over the skylights. So in winter they go up and in summer they come down to create shade. Now they're simply made out of old scooter wheels and there's a cord, a pulley that will pull it up and lower it down. So we did some temperature readings. I'll just uh, zoom in here so that you can actually see, get a good look at this. So they're about 200 off the galvanized iron roof. The roof on a 42 degree day is reading 84.5 degrees. Plant DNA dies at 60. Uh, so I sent these to David Benzing and he said uh, he'd love to know what the temperature inside the tissue of the plants is. Of course, one of the things that's happening with Talansias is they're using their silver trichomes to reflect large amounts of UV so it doesn't actually turn to heat, internal heat in the plant. Um, the shade, you can see just moving the thermometer across that much has reduced the temperature to 53.1. So that's that's more than a um, uh, 30 degree temperature difference. And if we're looking to mitigate heat in our cities on buildings, Talansias are a, a fantastic way to do it. And that's what we've been looking at. So my neighbors uh, wanted a screen over these windows here. And we constructed this, this little screen um and that's what it was like when it went in and you can see the plants are they're still growing they never water at all um and it faces west it does get rain uh which is good one of the things we found with the Talansia swarm project with all the plants on the various buildings was that if they're on east walls they don't get rain and they are the ones that die so well, strangely sorry enough, sorry, you switched out a screen share. We're seeing you, not the screen. Oh, we're not seeing it. Oh, okay, that's weird. Why? We're seeing you. Oh, you're I, seeing I, me. I see the screen, ah. Barry. Well, I've got the whole screen there. I can. Oh, see you've it. got the. I can, I can see. I can see the full screen. I can see the speaker as well. Yeah. Oh, okay. No so problem. just carry on. Carry on. I'm sorry. Okay. That's all right. So this is another one that we did. I did for uh, an art uh, project for the council and people uh, uh, wrote their name on the tags and tied them on. And this moves across the window as well. <clears throat> um, we came up with this proposal that never happened, but basically these were going to be Talansia screens that would move up and down the facade of a building driven by uh, at the tide. So there would be a float system with pulleys and so on. But we, unfortunately, we never got to do the project. We're looking at this project for um, Melbourne University. So they want to cover this building as a, an area where the staff go to sit uh, and have lunch and so on. And they want to cover these horrible kind of pipes industrial looking things. So we're looking at a couple of screens there, but all the universities if, uh, with the lockdown have gone into some kind of hemorrhage mode where <laughs> they don't know if they've got money anymore or not. So we don't know what's happening with that project. 
Um, this was a, a kind of interesting one that I did for um, a friend of mine who owns a, a restaurant uh, up in the country, uh, uh, several hours drive, uh, and he, away from where I live, and he has put in a sculpture walk through the bush and he built this dam. So what we actually did is we suspended one of the plant sculptures across the dam and it suspends just above the water. And the plants are just, they just love that, that kind of evaporation that's coming off the water. They just grow like mad. I haven't actually been able to get down and get some really good photographs of it yet. Um, we just haven't, haven't been there. Uh, he's also got this little sculpture up uh, outside his, uh, his restaurant. Um, this one here we're doing at the moment, and it's the biggest Tillandsia wall garden that we've done. It'll be around about 27 square metres. We've got most of the plants that we actually need. Uh, we are supposed to do it last year, but the COVID thing uh, sort of changed all that. It's for the, um, it's on the house of the Director of Sustainable Gardening Australia. So she was going to put a reticulated garden system in. And then when she heard of what we were doing with the air plants, she became very interested in, and we've been uh, working on this project. So it's gone through different forms, uh, ideas and things like that, but we are actually getting it together. Um, this is a, uh, another kind of experiment where uh, I wanted to see how Tillandsias would work uh, in salt environments. So for a bit of fun, I, I took one out for a surf and uh, I sent these on to David Benzing and he told me that he's actually seen Tillandsias growing right down on the roots of mangroves almost into the water. So some of them can withstand quite uh, torrid salt conditions as well. So um, you can, if you want to, this is called uh, Alpha Space and you can download that document as well. So what I'm gonna do now is jump to um, the Tillandsia Mania document the, that has got all of the, where I've been documenting the, um, the plants uh, and what I've done there is this is based on all of the plants that I've got in my collection. Um, so there's a little index there. You can click on the plants. There's photographs of the plants, details about the plants. There's links to um, which will take you to maps and other things on the right hand side. And this will give you an idea of uh, the sort of quality of this that you can you can get right in and you can see the um, the detail of the plants. By doing this as uh, an interactive PDF, it means uh, it's never uh, it's never kind of finished. I can keep working on it and change it every year, uh, and also. At the moment, it's running, I think, at something like 1,500 pages. So if you were printing that, the, the cost of printing it would just be astronomical. But it's got little um, microscopic shots of the trichomes um, and all, all various species. So on some of them, I've only got seedlings. <laughs> they still sort of growing on, but it gives you uh, a pretty good idea of all those plants. This so is, there's, this is all part of the ebook that people can buy, right? Yes, yeah, you, you, you can get all of that for $30 Australian, which I think is about probably 25 US or something. Um, there's a huge amount of work in putting this together. And it's something that I work on continually. So there's, there's Species A to M, N to Z, there's hybrids. And then uh, if we go here to the culture, so you, you, what you're doing is linking from one document to another. Uh, 
So yeah, it's got quite a lot of information about um, where bromeliads sit uh, in the plant is a plant family. Uh, where Talansia sit inside that. Um, you can enlarge any of these up and you can do a search, which is really handy as a PDF. So if we wanted to just, for instance, go to um, Trichome, uh, it'll actually find all of the places where that word is in the text and there's probably quite a few of them. Is it coming up? So it tells you where they are and you can you can find anything in the text just by doing a search. There is um, uh, an index which will, uh, I'll see if I can close that. <clears throat> so I'm just trying, I'll just see if I can find some of the um, some of the drawings. So this is talking about uh, the greenhouse, how I built it. <clears throat> we put under the ground, we put a series of, of pipes uh, and there's a, a fan that draws air in through the pipes and back out again. That uh, will actually um, cool it down in summer, but it will also heat it in winter. So when it's about one degree outside on a really cold night, it'll be pulling air in about six degrees and vice versa in, in summer when it's really hot. <clears throat> one thing that has proved to work really well is a long, this is all built out of junk material, is along the bottom uh, are little flat windows on both sides. So when it gets really hot, I can lift those up and the air circulates in from the ground underneath. And that has quite a considerable uh, cooling effect. In the top, there's vents that let the heat out. This is the, um, the, pump, uh, the fan here that I, uh, was in the video. So um, there's all sorts of information in there. Greater information, uh, like explaining what the difference between monocots and dicots, um, all, all sorts of information in there that you can, these are just trichome patterns, um, drawings like this that I've done that explain all the cell structure. Um, so it's just something that I continue to, to work on. Um, so maybe if anyone's got any questions, um, we could go from there. Well, I, I have a question for you. Uh, so if we go to this website and we, we, down, we download the PDFs for the Talanzia mania section, then uh, next you, year, I'm sorry, if we make changes next year, how would we update to receive your changes? Uh, the, the, the first time you buy, uh, purchase it, it's $30. The, the update is 20. The, the Talanzia mania, you won't be able to download from the website. You, you'll have to send me an email and I'll send you Dropbox links. The files are big. Uh, they're really big files because I wanted to keep the resolution of the images up as much as I could. And, uh, um, you know, so what it means is you can zoom in. So we're looking at about 200% enlargement. Wow. It's and, you know, you can, you, you can go in there. The photos. So are I mean, the, um, so you can't get that in uh, in a printed book as well. You you just can't go into the detail, you know, that way. So um, all of the books are available uh, free. 
except the Talanzia mania ones because I've just put too much work into them. <laughs> but it, it here, for instance, it shows the the three sections of the seed pod that have split, and shows the seed shows the seed germinating. Um, one of the things that we've kind of tracked down, which is sort of interesting down here, is um, let's see if I can go in here a bit closer. Is sometimes if you um, if you split the seed pod open, the seed will be green and it's almost growing inside the seed pod. So you have a seed that looks like this. This is off the same plant. So once the seed pod has split and it's left for a few days and the seed isn't misted and it's not, it's not humid, it's not wet, it will actually grow this hard brown casing over the seed and it becomes more difficult for the seed to um, uh, to actually germinate. So sometimes it's it's better to break the seed pod just before they're about to burst than to wait until it's actually broken, if that makes sense. Um, but do you, how do there, you do that? I'm sorry, how do you do that with tweezers? Or, I mean, this is tiny, tiny uh, stuff. Just take it between your, your hands and just twist it in and it'll break apart and then you can um, um, and then you can kind of work from there. Yeah, it, they'll, they'll, they'll twist apart and you can pull a seed out with tweezers. Um, so any other questions there? I'm just flicking through some of this stuff, so. How do you affix the plants to their frames? What do you use? Uh, what we, uh, it depends where we're, you mean the sculpture frames and, and the ones on the buildings. Um, we tend to, there's a thing called double or triple redundancy. So if we tend to wire them on, but we don't just use one wire, we'll actually use several. And depending on the structure, we may put a mesh on the back and the front of the plants to hold them in place so they they don't they don't blow off. Um, it's sort of interesting once the plants get going, um, they will actually produce roots that will uh, adhere to uh, steel and stainless steel. They'll they'll actually fix themselves to metal. Um, <clears throat> so and you know. Talanzia roots are, are very, um, very strong things. Once they once they fix onto something, they are really there. Uh, but we we'll often take the uh, the wire and wrap it. We'll tie the plant on, and then we may wrap it in like a spiral one way, and then we spiral the wire the other way. So it kind of sits in like a fishnet stocking, uh, and it holds there. Um, uh, occasionally plants can come off, uh, but the more fixings you put on, the, um, uh, the less chance of that happening. I have a question about the um, use of these plants in, on buildings where fire codes are pretty strict as they are here in Southern California. <clears throat> Have you received uh, problems in that regard in Australia? Um, no, we we haven't had any any problems. I mean, the thing with um, any plant material will burn, uh, Andrew. Um, but one of the things that we're doing with this, of course, is that the, there's no flammable material associated with. Um, uh, the infrastructure that holds the plants on, whereas some of the um, vertical gardens where they're reticulating water down, although they've got water running down the the the, the um, uh, medium, uh, the the mediums now a lot of them are made of, as I said, microfiber plastic, and that can burn. That's PET plastic, so it produces toxic fumes as well. Talanzias are not really one of the most flammable plants around. I agree. Uh, 
I remember seeing the video recently with Paul Isley talking about how the plants had bounced back after the fire in his nursery. And I think he was saying something like 30% of the plants actually survived. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Lloyd, uh, Lloyd yeah. This, is, this is Nels. And I was wondering in the installation, if you were going to put it up on a building, would they usually want to already have the screen more or less filled in or are they willing to wait for three or four years to have the plants grow together? Uh, that depends on the person we're putting it in for. Uh, the one that we're doing in Melbourne, uh, which will be going in, in uh, probably in the next month or so, um, they want a, a reasonable cover on that. Uh, we're looking at, uh, as a maintenance uh, uh, rotation, probably about every three or four years, we would go back and, and lighten the, um, the loading on the plants. It depends on the plants, of course, how, how fast they're, they're growing. To give you a comparison with a lot of reticulated vertical garden systems, the people that put these in are very cagey about the, the, what they do and the information. But having spoken to people on the ground who actually uh, are actually doing the physical work, they've told me the maintenance is usually about once every two months. So to give you uh, a comparison, the ones that we've had on top of Eureka Tower, six years, we've never touched them. Uh, and they're, they're still growing. They're growing into a, quite a nice colony, whereas they would have been doing six visits um, every year. So that's 36 visits, and there's a uh, considerable cost in that. The big vertical garden they've got in Sydney, which is 33 stories, which is uh, an iconic uh, vertical garden and gets publicized a huge amount. Uh, when they launched that vertical garden, they said the maintenance, anticipated maintenance bill would be 200,000. Uh, it's currently running over a million dollars a year to, yeah. to maintain. Sure. Um, so, you know, Lloyd, the, the one thing I would say is it's a completely different look. Now, we're Talanzia people, so we love it. But it's a monoclonal or a mono-optical look. You know, in other words, the, the reticulated gardens with a lot of foliage plants, that's a very special verdant look. But I'm, I'm guessing it's like 10,000 times the cost. So there's many advantages to the, to the Talanzias, but I will say they're much less visually exciting. I mean, it's just the reality. That's well, I was, I was going to ask Lloyd if, if you had ever considered, uh, because I know a lot of these uh, vertical gardens have different designs to them. And I was wondering if you were considering using six or seven, maybe eight or, or 10 different species where you could do different, different uh, designs, uh, whether flowing, curving or whatever to compose the, the whole design. Uh, we'd certainly like to do that. Uh, two of the things that are a bit restrictive for us at the moment is, one, the Melbourne climate is, is uh, uh, certainly not what it would be in Sydney or Brisbane, uh, further up the coast, you know, thousands of kilometres up the coast. Or um, the other is that the Australian government put a, a um, quarantine a stop on, uh, um, import stop on, plants coming in from America and Europe. So it means we can only get under very special conditions, get plants in from Asia. So it limits the range of plants that we can, uh, we can actually put in. Um, <clears throat> look, um, it is one of the criticisms that they, are, uh, they don't have big green leaves and they don't have amazing flowers and so on. The one in Sydney, um, they skited that, uh, you know, there were over 300 species of plants and the flowers and the butterflies would come and the bees would come and, and uh, uh, the flowers would have these little berries and it would be fantastic. And it was, 
but uh, they had plants all the way to the ground and um, the rats moved in as well. So when you when you invite nature in, uh, you, you can't dictate which which bits of nature will actually come in. So they had quite a huge problem with rats getting onto the onto the wall and scaling the building. It, there's clearly advantages for the Tlanthias, and clearly in the evolution of this field, which you have given birth to in Australia, down the road maybe people can grow enough to have significant uh, different plants. But you know. Your government so intensely limits, you know, it's not like you can just order 10,000 Ionanthas from Guatemala tomorrow. It's just, it's cost prohibitive. The Ionantha down here wouldn't make it through the winter. Um, you know, the, one of the problems we run into is most of the rain that we get is in winter. Whereas if you go to Brent, uh, Brisbane, uh, most of the rain they get actually is in summer and the winters are drier oh. <clears throat> and it's the temperatures are much warmer so we've got to be realistic about what we, we're trialling a lot more plants like in Canata and, and plants like that but uh, Capitata and stuff like that we just we wouldn't be able to do outdoors unfortunately um, I've got uh, some of the little seedlings that I've got coming on. Um, some of them got some pretty pretty amazing red leaves and that's crossing uh, burger eye with eranthus. Uh, to, to give you an idea, uh, last year I actually did a count and on one day I pollinated over 700 flowers. Uh, so we've got miles and miles of little seedlings, but as everyone knows, Talanzias aren't quick growers. They don't grow fast, but they don't die fast either. Well, it's, it's again, you're developing an entire alternative mm -hmm. to an existing, you know, part of an industry. You know, you're, you're a pioneer and it's going to take significant development. So I really want to thank you for what you're doing. It's, it's astonishing. Oh, well, thanks, Barry. I, I mean, I think all Tlanzia growers will uh, will be involved in this as time goes on and people realise that they um, uh, they're highly resilient plants that we can we can put in um, urban environments. We we'd love to do some work suspending them on screens between buildings, and we nearly had an opportunity to do that uh, here in Melbourne, but it uh, the funds got gobbled up by another another project so it didn't quite happen but the the design of that was huge it was um they wanted a a thousand square meters of air plants suspended wow. suspended across the space to create intermittent shade to cool it down in summer at that point we could have got plants in from uh uh the uh, North and South America but uh, after then they they closed that and we can't do that now. Have you worked with using UIDs? Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, it, look, the thing with that one is it just turns up. It's, it's, there's always a bit of it tangled into something else and like the screens uh, I've got that move over the skylight, I sit down here and I see these old bits of old man's beard dangling away in the wind and they've just got there by themselves you know they've been tangled into some other plant that was put on there and it yeah it's highly resilient that plant it's amazing yeah I was at a home in Oaxaca one time and there was uh, on the outdoor entry to the home uh, they suspended uh, like almost like a um, a metal a metal um, uh, piece of uh, rectangular uh, object, and then they they tied to uh, it was neoides to it. It was about uh, fifteen feet long, and they would raise that or lower it depending on how much uh, shade they wanted in that area. It was very interesting. Yeah, well, exactly. That's the thing, and the thing you can do with Talanzia screens is animate them. See, if, you, if you've got a, uh, a reticulated vertical garden screen and it's weighing about 100 kilos um, a square meter, you just physically can't move that up and down or backwards and forwards. It's just, it's just too much weight. 
Um, and what we're trying to do is keep the weight down to around about um, five kilos a square meter and maintain it at that that sort of weight. That, so that's a huge, um, huge I think advantage. this is all. I think this. This is something that we we all, as Talanzia enthusiasts, uh, we can all share in, um, and I think it's only going to grow in the future. Uh, there are other plants, of course, uh, like uh, Acmea nudicalis that um, you know they just grow fine down here. You can put them on a wall, and and they're fine. Um, the, 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 they just keep multiplying and they're hardy as anything and they're beautiful plants and they have big flowers. So it's not just Talanzias. Uh, there are other plants that you can use. But the main thing for us is to try and um, work with plants that we don't have to have water at the roots. Um, in fact, there was a, a vertical garden here in uh, Melbourne that Patrick Blanc had designed, and he put varicias on the uh, uh, as part of the design, and they kept dying, and there was no misting, and he was just there was just water at the roots, and they just rotted and died, and then they replaced them four or five times, and eventually the whole thing was just pulled out as a as a failure. Um, Lloyd, I have I'm sorry, I have one other question, uh, completely out of this realm, but about bromeliads. When did you get your first bromeliad? What age were you when you got into bromeliads? Oh, uh, probably around about 1986, I bought my first um, so you were first bromeliads. 25? Uh, probably a bit older, yeah. Okay. I was born 1952, so. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, yeah, one, one wanted, of the... I wanted to bring up Sorry, something Paul? before before we uh, get too far along. Um, Gene, our um, newsletter editor, has put up a lot of links in the uh, chat section. So if you're interested in uh, links to some of Lloyd's uh, uh, websites and uh, things like that, and also for from our club, uh, please go to the uh, to the chat section, you'll find it at the lower side of the uh, Zoom screen and you can uh, jot down the information, um, any of the information that you're uh, interested in. Um, one of the things too, Paul, is that uh, most of the projects I'm doing, I post bits and pieces on um, Planet Talanzia, so you can keep up with what it is we're actually doing there. And uh, hopefully other people will pick up some of this stuff and uh, develop their own ways of how you can integrate these amazing plants into architecture. Well, I think it's fabulous. Yeah, Lloyd, your creativity and uh, insights and knowledge is fantastic and um, one thing I get out of a presentation like this are ideas of what I might want to change or do differently in my garden. And uh, thank you. You're, you're welcome. It's, it's fantastic to uh, share all this with um, other people. And uh, I look forward to seeing how all this develops in, in, in the future. You know, we can start taking over more buildings. <laughs> <laughs> it's a revolution. <laughs> the the other thing with the swarm project that we are, we are trying to pair up with a um, university is that um, of course Talanzi is also taking uh, heavy metal particulates out of the atmosphere, so we can actually test the leaf and tell you the comparative uh, pollution level at various parts of the city. And uh, when I discovered this, I sent uh, an email on to David Benzing and said, wow, David, have a look at this. And he said, yeah, I invented that <laughs> back, <laughs> back in, the, in Florida in the 1970s or something. So, um, it's, it's uh, a, but it's it, a, they're bioassay organisms. Yeah, they'll, they'll take all of those nasties that come out of burning fossil fuels. They'll abs yeah. slowly absorb them into the leaf. 
Amazing. And of course, they're 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 doing fulfilling another role as well that they're um, uh, using a cam cycle to grow at night. Yes. So uh, when most other plants in a city are non functioning in terms of uh, cleaning up the atmosphere, Talansias can take over. Yeah, but you Which just in sealing up uh, seal plants in, in Brazil, for, che for checking the pollutants there. Yeah, yeah, they, they were doing tests on, on the uh, heavy metal particulates in Argentina and Colombia as well, and uh, David had done done those tests in Florida with lead. So are these specialized labs that you use to do those tests? Uh, we haven't connected on, uh, with anyone on that yet, uh, Ken. We're, we're sort of, um, uh, it's highly complicated. Some of the universities that have got the means to do this run courses on run, how to, uh, they run, they run uh, programs on uh, vertical gardens, teaching their their students to um, put in, install um, reticulated systems. And because most of their graduates are getting um, uh, jobs maintaining vertical gardens, uh, we come along with a system that doesn't need much maintenance, so they really don't want to know too much about us. <laughs> 